Hello? Okay. I'll get, I'll get going here. Um, I, underst I understand Glendale time is a little um, slower, but it's about two minutes after, so maybe we'll have some more people trickling in um, as I'm speaking. But again, I'm Mark McDonald. I'm uh, Glendale College's lobbyist up in Sacramento. Um, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate the applause. Um, you know, we're, we've been working diligently on legislation and a lot of budget issues, obviously, this year. Um, I'll be presenting a budget and legislative update tonight at the board meeting. Um, today, I was asked to give kind of a brief, more general overview of the legislative process, the budget process, how those two processes impact the college, and then a brief overview on redistricting and what I feel are, will be the outcomes of redistricting, if any, um, and how it'll work, and just real briefly how it'll impact this region. Um, I'm going to stop periodically throughout the presentation. I'll stop after budget process and after community colleges and the legislature to answer questions. There's a microphone up here that um, Andrew can can walk around if you have a question so that they can hear you. I understand this is being recorded. Um, and then obviously at the end, after I talk a, a briefly about redistricting, we can open it up to questions on any topic. Um, so first off, the legislative process, the, the basics. You have, we're a bicameral system. We have two houses. We have an assembly, which has 80 members, and a senate, which has 40 members. Um, the assembly members are elected for two years each. Um, senators are elected uh, for four years each. Assembly members have three terms of two years that they can serve. Senators have two terms of four years that they can serve. Um, each legislative cycle is basically the life of a legislature, of an assembly member's term. So we have two year cycles, legislative cycles, and at the end of that year, the second year is always an even year, it culminates with an election. So we're in the first year of the two year legislative cycle right now. It'll end at the end of 2012 with the election in the fall. The new members will come in in 2013 and we'll start a new um, legislative calendar. So every year, politicians in Sacramento are very busy. Every year there are about 2,500 different measures that are introduced. Um, these can be regular bills, assembly bills, or Senate bills. There's about, I'd say, twice as many assembly bills as there are Senate bills, just because there are twice as many assembly members as there are senators. Um, but you also get into these extraordinary sessions which run parallel to the regular session. And these have been common the last couple years. Anytime the state declares a fiscal emergency, we go into what's called an extraordinary session. And so we get all kinds of bills that are introduced in the extraordinary sessions. Um, these are the same exact, they hold the same exact, um, they're the same exact type of laws as in regular assembly bills and in regular Senate bills. They just happen to be moving through the extraordinary session, which tends to run on a faster track. There's also um, resolutions that are introduced in both houses. Now, these do not have the force of law. The governor doesn't have the authority to sign or veto these. These are just legislative intent. So um, bills that you likely wouldn't get the governor's signature on may be run as resolutions that say it is the legislature's intent that, you know, California maximize green products to the greatest extent possible. Doesn't hold the force of law, but it gives a brief uh, generalization of what the legislature at that time um, has as an intention for California's policy direction. And then finally, you get constitutional amendments. Now, all of these things, except for constitutional amendments, are passed on a majority vote. 
constitutional amendments, ACA, Assembly Constitutional Amendment, or SCA, Senate Constitutional Amendment, need a two-thirds vote of both houses of the legislature, they need the governor's signature, and then they go out to the ballot, and that's what you vote on. So a couple years ago, there was a spending cap that was put on the ballot. That was a constitutional amendment that was a part of the budget process. Um, the governor's proposed to extend the current tax rates. He's put that in a constitutional amendment that would require a two-thirds vote, and then you would vote on it assuming it went out um, to the ballot. So where do these bills come from? There's basically three places that they come from. Internally, the legislator's office, um, from constituents, or from lobbyists. I'd say the vast majority of bills come from lobbyists of some sort. Internal, where do those come from? It could be a personal issue that the member has. It could be a past unresolved issue. It, you'll notice, well, I, every year there are staff members in legislator's office that go through all the bills from the previous years that have been vetoed or died, and they look for what they consider good bills or issues that their member would be interested in in order to reintroduce those. We've had a bill relating to community colleges that would allow community college, community colleges currently can't go into state um, correctional facilities to offer courses to inmates. Um, Senator Cox up from Sacramento introduced the bill probably six years ago. Senator, then Senator Scott, now Chancellor Jack Scott, did the bill uh, three years ago before he was Senator and now Assemblyman Sandre Swanson out of Oakland has been running the bill for the last two years. So that's just an internal issue that legislators have talked about and has continued to come up and come up and come up. The issue on that one, by the way, has been the cost associated with it. Or staff members will bring issues to the, le to the legislator. Um, constituents, a member might get a letter um, they might be at a, an event in their local community and they might speak with one of their constituents who brings up an issue and they say, hey, that sounds like a good, good idea. They'll have one of their staff members investigate it. It can be introduced as a law. Um, what a lot of members are doing now are what they call their ought to be a law contests and they'll have their constituents email them or write in with proposed bill ideas. There ought to be a law to do this. Um, Senator Simidian, the hands-free cell phone bill, that was a there ought to be a law contest out of uh, Senator Simidian, who's up uh, near San Mateo, out of his district. There ought not be a law or is a new kind of contest that's gaining some popularity, um, which is when a member asks his or her constituents what forms of regulation or what laws are getting in the way that, that just don't make sense and ought to be repealed. So sometimes those are introduced as well. So then the final group, and what I said was the most common group, and the San Jose Mercury News actually ran a series of articles on this for those of you that are interested on where bills come from and found that the majority of the bills come from lobbyists, brought to, to lobbyists, um, of course, by their clients. So I wouldn't say that the majority of the bills come from lobbyists, but rather the majority of the bills come from um, interests that have hired lobbyists, like community colleges, like if Glendale College had, there was a law that wasn't working for Glendale College, or um, there was a particular issue that Glendale College had, they would bring that to me, to McCallum Group. We'd go, we'd find an author for the bill, and then that author would run the bill. So what's the process? Um, again, general concept. A bill gets introduced. It's assigned to a policy committee. There are probably 20 policy committees in each house that oversee a particular policy area. So you have education. In the assembly, you have an education committee and a higher education committee. The Senate's smaller, so they have just an education committee that deals with all higher ed and um, K-12 issues. Um, you have a local government committee. You have a transportation committee. You have a sports, tourism, and internet committee. All different sorts of uh, committees, actually. And then the bill has to go through the policy committee, and then if it is scored with any sort of cost, 
it goes through a fiscal committee, which is called an appropriations committee. If it gets through its first house, we have a bicameral system, like I said, where we have two houses, then it moves to the second house, where again, it goes through another policy committee, and it goes through another fiscal committee. Now, somebody asked me, why, why do we have a bicameral system? Um, a lot of governments in Europe have a unicameral system. They have just one legislative body um, with a prime minister elected by the, um, who, who leads the majority party um, in, the, in the House. Well, a bicameral system actually makes bills easier to kill. <laughs> it makes it easier to stop. So I, our, our, found, our uh, model here in California models the federal model, which was basically created to slow down the progress of government. It was, uh, Bill has to go through hurdles in two houses and then at the governor's or at the federal level, the president's desk in order to get signed into law. And so that's at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven places that an opposition, an opponent has to stop the bill. So in the first committee, in the, in the fiscal committee, on the floor, in the policy committee of the second house, in the fiscal committee of the second house, on the floor of the second house, and then at the governor's desk. So really the system's set up to not pass legislation, to make legislation difficult to pass. So what does a lobbyist do? It's kind of funny. Um, I've been lobbying for about probably six or seven years now, and um, about a year and a half ago, we were, I was sitting down at um, dinner, and we were having some friends over, and we were talking, and um, our guest goes, so, you know, what do you do? And I say, well, I'm a lobbyist, and they go, well, well what is that? What do you do? And my wife looks at me, and she goes, yeah, what do you do? <laughs> and I think there's this perception that, it, you know, lobbyists just, Glad hands, smiles, goes to meetings, work lunches, um, fundraisers. It's actually a little different than that. It's a lot of work when you're in the trenches um, trying to get bills passed, trying to stop bad leg legislation. Um, as I said, there's about 2,500 bills uh, introduced every year, and it's our job to screen every single one of those bills that's introduced. And from that 2,500, you'll probably have about 150 that will directly impact your college. We analyze those 150 more specifically, dig down to how it will impact our client, and then relay that message onto our client. Client makes the decision of which direction they'd like us to proceed. Um, and then it's our job to make sure that bill either moves through the legislature or dies. Also, with these 2,500 bills that are introduced, there are daily amendments. So we get, a, we get a list of amendments that come in every day, and there's deadlines throughout the year as to when you can amend a bill. And you, as you can imagine, when you're turning in your homework, if you're a student, you usually wait till the last minute. Um, receiving homework, for those of you who are faculty in here, you know, you usually don't get assignments early. Um, the same is the case for legislators. You have a deadline when you can amend bills, when you can introduce bills. That's when all the amendments occur. So you could have hundreds of bills being amended in one day. Um, and I've, at points, sat in front of a computer, scrolled down reading these. I looked away from the computer, and there was still a white box with black words going down it. And I thought maybe I needed a little break then. Um, so we monitor all those amendments. Um, at the end of the year, um, you've probably gone through close to 200, 250 bills that have been amended and possibly could impact the college in some way. Um, and again, as I said earlier, we provide detailed analysis to our clients on how the bills will impact the college. And that's a two-way street. We also get feedback um, on how the bills would impact the college because you on the ground know best um, about how a certain policy is going to directly impact your college's workings. Um, the other things we do, if you have a sponsored bill, um, it's our job to find an author for that bill. 
um, which can be incredibly difficult. Actually, I think that's probably the most difficult thing we do. Um, that, that entails putting together a detailed analysis, both policy and political. You want to find out who the players are, who would oppose the bill, who's going to support the bill, any potential costs to the bill. Um, you want to identify a good author, preferably an author who is chair of the policy committee that the bill will go through. If not that, that person sits on the committee that the bill will go through. And then it's our job to shepherd the legislation through the legislature. Um, each committee has two consultants, at least. There's a Democratic consultant that provides a, an analysis specifically to Democratic members, but since Democrats control, control both houses, that's also the public analysis. But then the Republican caucus also has an analyst who provides an analysis for his or her members. So it's our job to meet with those people prior to the bill being heard in the committee so that we can provide them our detailed analysis on how we feel the bill would, would have, um, you know, would, would impact our clients. Um, usually, the analysts go with our analysis. At times, they do not, um, uh, which is difficult. But then you have to, you know, you get into a back and forth debate. Um, and it's our job to convince them that we're right and that you're right. Um, we provide written and verbal input on bills um, and policy proposals. So after we ha get the analysis done, we go to each member of the committee to discuss the, the policy with them um, and try to convince them to vote in the, in the way that we would like. Um, we provide testimony, so we're standing up in front of the committee. And a committee, I always describe, so people ask, well, what's a committee hearing like? I say, I'm going to go into a committee hearing. A committee hearing is like being in court with less rules. Um, the irony is, is that there's, there's less rules in the making of the law, I think, than there is in, in the interpreting of the laws, which would be in a court of law. But usually there's a, there's a bench. Um, there's probably six to 15 members of the committee sitting in front of you with the chair. Um, each person provides testimony. Um, there's an opportunity for all the members to ask a question, and then a vote's taken. Um, and your bill either gets out or it doesn't. Um, the other thing we do is we provide government relations and provide uh, requests for information. So we're essentially um, Glendale College's constant presence in Sacramento. So when Mike Gatto or Anthony Portentino or Carol Liu have a question about how something will impact Glendale College, um, they call. They call over to us. If there's um, a bill that's up in a committee before them, they'll call and, and get Glendale's position on it. Um, it could be an informal analysis of how it would impact the college because the college doesn't take a position on all 150 bills uh, that impact them. Um, they'll take a, a position on maybe 30 to 50 of those bills. We also provide um, strategic advice and messaging. So if um, oftentimes members of your college will come up to Sacramento and do legislative visits, we'll arrange those visits, we'll provide talking points, targeted, focused issues um, that are relevant at the time. Over the last year, you had a, um, a government relations group come up to Sacramento and, and met with a number of legislators, and you had two student, student groups that came up to Sacramento and lobbied on behalf of the college. And um, we provided appointments and, and talking points and um, strategic messaging um, for those visits. So the budget process, this is what you've been hearing the, the most about lately. Um, and to be quite honest, it's kind of a convoluted process. Um, it takes a different shape every year, it seems like. And this year has been maybe the most unique shape that I've ever seen. You have a new law in place where members can't get paid if they don't pass a balanced budget, which the controller has just said they haven't done, so they're not getting paid. Um, you have a new governor who's trying to push for an election to increase taxes that requires a two-thirds vote, 
after we just had a val ballot measure passed that allows the legislature to pass a budget for the first time with a majority vote. But they can't increase taxes. So it's been, you know, it's been quite the uh, soap opera up in Sacramento. But this is the way it's supposed to work. You're supposed to have two separate tracks, a budget track and a legislative track. Your legislative track is just what I talked about. Your budget track, you have your committee hearings. You go to a conference committee where you iron out your differences. You go to your floor votes, and then it goes to the governor to be signed or vetoed. And the budget process is only supposed to deal with money and how it's allocated. Policy decisions are supposed to be made through the legislative track, where policy committees have the chance to weigh in on all the different aspects of a policy change and all the implications that that policy change could have. Well, this is how it really works for a number of reasons. Number one is, as we all know, money drives policy. And number two is, lately, Republican legislators, the only voice that they've had has been in the budget process because of the two-thirds requirement. So consequently, your policy decisions and the decisions that your policy committees are supposed to be making have been pulled into the budget process. And we've seen it specifically, you know, working here with Glendale in financial aid areas, in the courses, types of courses you can offer. I'm, I'm sure you've heard there's been constant pressure to um, limit the number of times a student can take a PE course. There's been talks about limiting the number of units a student can acquire, period, um, without having to pay the full cost of tuition. Um, all these policy decisions are being pulled into the budget process right now um, for those two reasons, because we're, we're so short on money and um, we've been seeking a two-thirds vote on the budget, and that's where the Republicans can really make policy plays is in the budget process. And of course, our job up there is to always say, no, these need to be vetted in the policy committees. We need to move these to the policy committee so we can have a full understanding of the consequences of making these decisions. Usually, when these types of decisions are made in the budget process, they're made at the last minute, they're inserted, and there's not a whole lot of thought as to the consequences that those actions will lead to. And we end up coming back and revisiting them um, continually. We're doing, we're doing that right now with, with a decision that was made on financial aid in the budget process. Um, so a quick overview of the budget process. Just like policy committees have their own special areas, you have budget committees that they have their own special areas. You have a Senate Education Budget Committee and an Assembly Education Budget Committee that are separate from the Education Policy Committees. So to start off the process, the governor introduces his budget or her budget, and the policy committees hear the various proposals within their policy um, jurisdiction. So the Education Committee will meet in the Assembly, the Education Committee in the Senate will meet, and they'll craft a general outline of the budget. Those won't always be the same. So those will go to what's called a conference committee, which is essentially three members of the assembly, three members of the Senate, two Democrats in each house, and one Republican. So what normally emerges from the conference committee, which is where they iron out the differences between the assembly and the Senate, is the Democratic budget pl plan. Traditionally, that's been the case just because the Democrats have controlled both houses. Um, once you have that general budget plan put in place, you have what's called the Big Five meetings. These have come into, come into being basically because you need a two-thirds vote and you need Republican sign-off on a budget deal. So the Big Five are the governor, the leader of the Democrats in the assembly, the leader of the Republicans in the assembly, the leader of the Democrats in the Senate, and the leader of the Republicans in the Senate. And they'll iron out the big ticket issues like tax policy, or if there need to be additional cuts, then they'll make additional cuts. Um, this is where the final agreement is, is cut, the final deal's cut, the bill then moves to the floor. Now this is the first year that we haven't need two-thirds of a vote, a two-thirds vote to pass a budget. So the recent budget that you saw was passed on a majority vote. There were some questions whether some of the things they did could be done with a majority vote, but they were. Um, traditionally, 
The budgets required a two-thirds vote. That's why you've seen these all-night sessions. There was, I can't remember if it was last year or two years ago, these budget sessions seem to run all together now, but a budget bill was literally passed at like five o'clock in the morning. So they had gone into, they'd gone in at nine o'clock the day before, 9 a.m. They'd worked all day, they passed a budget at 5 a.m. the next morning. Needless to say, that's where we get into those issues where last-minute decisions are made that aren't totally thought out. Um, so then that goes to the governor. Governor can sign or veto it. For the first time in known history, the governor vetoed the budget this year. Um, if the governor vetoes the budget, it can go back to the legislature to be overturned, but that requires a two-thirds vote. So I'll stop there real quick to see if there are any questions. Um, on anything that I've gone over so far? You mentioned that the, um, it, when the budget was passed, this la last one, that they included some things in there that you didn't think were totally kosher. And I assume you're referring to some of the tax increases. What, were the, what was the argument that they could pass the tax increases with uh, simply a majority? The way that they did it was a complicated, um, what they called, what they did before was they did what was called a triple flip. And it's a complement, complicated mechanism where they shifted a local sales tax to the, to the state. They backfilled the local sales tax, um, or they backfilled funding that came from the state with the local sales tax um, and in order to score savings on the budget. Well, what they did this year was called a double flip, was essentially undoing that. And the reason, and then they made a couple tax changes that were impacted locally. And the reasoning was that there's, there's this debate as to whether you can increase taxes at the state level at all without a majority vote, or can you lower taxes in one area and increase them in another area so that the net change is even, and then that doesn't constitute technically a tax increase, um, even though you end up with savings and additional revenue to the general fund. And that was one of the things they did on the sales tax. Um, in the controllers, uh, when the controller opined that the budget was not balanced, that wasn't one of the issues that he brought up. Um, so there's still a question as to whether they can do it or not. Um, they do, my, I, my understanding is they have a legal opinion from their um, ledge counsel that it can be done. And it seemed from the controller's um, um, opinion that if they kind of cleaned it up a little bit that it would at least be acceptable to him. But it would likely be um, challenged in court. Um, but there's, there were, a lot of different mechanisms going on um, in that budget, which also included an additional um, VLF, vehicle license fee increase um, that was questionable because we also had prop, I believe it was, I can't remember the name of the prop this past year that, that said fees needed a two thirds vote as well. Um, and that was increased on a majority vote. Um, um, the other issue, I know this wasn't your question, was um, Prop 98 was underfunded. Prop 98 is money for community colleges and K-12 schools. It was underfunded by about a billion dollars. And there's a question as to whether that can be done on a majority vote. Um, um, many think that you need, well, in law you need a two-thirds vote to suspend Prop 98, but um, there's also an argument that you can under appropriate it on a majority vote um, as long as you repay it when the assumed revenues come in higher. So I don't know if that answered your question, but. Any other questions? Okay. So why is this important to community colleges? Um, California is probably one of the most highly regulated states in the nation, and 
every single aspect of particularly a community college, well, almost every single aspect of a community college is um, dictated by the state, by state law or regulations that go through the chancellor's office. Um, community colleges do have a unique governance structure in that they're funded by local property taxes in combination with state funding. Um, that makes up Prop 98, and that provides a certain amount of protection to community college and K-12 school funding. Um, but the majority of the funding comes from the state since Prop 13 has really shifted the funding of local entities to the state. And with money comes essentially power. And so if the state's allocating the money, um, they feel, they being the legislatures and um, the governor, believe that they ought to be able to dictate how that money is spent. And for community colleges, it kind of presents a weird dichotomy because we're, we're also governed by locally elected officials, which is your board. You'll have a board meeting tonight. Um, they are charged with managing the daily workings, well, not the daily, but they're charged with managing the broad policy of the district. And back before Prop 13, they also controlled a lot of the purse strings um, through local property taxes. Um, so your local community really paid for all the workings of the college. But after Prop 13, you have funding coming from the state. You've got increased regulations coming from the state because of the increased funding. And so a lot of the decisions that your local board makes, their hands are really tied. Just to give you an example, with declining funds at the, at the state level, there was a the legislature put intent language in the last budget that local districts were to prioritize transfer, career tech, and basic skills programs. This was a compromise from you know, the LAO, which is a different entity. Basically, the LAO is the legislature's um, budget analyst. Um, the LAO recommended that PE classes be cut um, and recommended putting a cap on PE courses. Well, the compromise language that we were able to get was this intent language to have co local boards prioritize these other courses, and then you'd be able to use your PE courses or your dance courses, what they call enrichment courses, um, based on the population you're serving. Well, another, a district um, uh, north of here cut some particular PE courses um, going with the direction that they've been given by the legislature. Well, two of those board members were subsequently voted off the board because the local community was upset that these specific courses that they used um, were cut. So I, I don't envy local trustees. They have a very difficult job. They're um, tasked with responding to their community needs, but at the same time, their hands are really tied and becoming more tied these days with the dwindling resources um, coming from the state. So the state oversees the budget of the community colleges and the working operations. And the budget process supports the, the college's funding levels. It supports your general apportionments, how many courses you're gonna offer. Um, it also supports your categorical programs, um, your student success programs. Um, the last couple years, the debate has been where are the cuts going to come? Are they going to come from general apportionments? Are they going to come from categorical programs? You know, five years ago, we were saying, well, where are we going to put the money? Are we going to put it into general fund growth so that we can add more students? Are we going to put it into categorical programs so that we can improve student success? Um, and that all changed. And all changed very quickly. And, and we've gotten into this defensive mode where we've been trying to save programs. Two years ago, you're, just so you know, you're, some of your categorical programs, which are like your um, financial aid, your EOPNS programs, uh, your disabled students programs, um, your matriculation programs, um, programs that are out there to help, help students succeed, some of them were cut as much as 50%. And so you know at the state level, at, while those courses are being cut by 50%, we're hearing from the legislators, legislators, 
well, why, why aren't all your students graduating? Why, why don't we have students you know, moving through? Why do you have students dropping out? Why can't students complete courses? Why aren't you assessing every single student that comes to your campus? And, and so there's, I think, a real disconnect between what's being allocated to accomplish certain goals that are being set and, and the setting of those goals. I mean, we have a bill that's being introduced this year to set up an accountability framework for all of higher education. And we're looking at it, and it's not a bad bill, but in the context of the budget, you're looking at it with a community college. Okay, um, what type of accountability do we, do we want? Are we going to deny you know, 50,000 students classes, or are we gonna deny 100,000 students classes? It's, it, there's a real disconnect there, I think. Um, one of the other things that's determined through the budget is flexibility. The last couple years, because these um, student success program, categorical programs have been cut, um, the legislature offer, authorized some flexibility to move funds within the categorical programs, but what we found, the reality is, is that colleges are taking a lot of their general funds and, and backfilling the categorical programs um, to increase student success and help students. Um, legislation, anything can be legislated, anything. So, I'm sorry, let me take a step back. Also determined in the budget process is the fees, how high your fee levels are. Um, it, it was 20, went up to 26, current proposal is 36, probably stay there. Unless there's additional cuts, it could go as high as 40, but I doubt that at this point um, because of the protections of Prop 98 that I mentioned earlier. I, I doubt that we'll get to 40. Um, legislation, that's all your working operations. Um, how much students can be charged for health care, for your health fee is determined through legislation. Um, transportation fees. Um, contracting requirements. Who the college can contract with and how they have to do it in order to build a facility. Um, how the college can contract um, to purchase seats for this auditorium. Um, assessment and transfer, uh, how colleges assess students, whether colleges have to assess all students. Um, transfer bill last year, AB 1440, one of the you know, more uh, prominent bills that went through the legislature last year, requires all CSUs to take students who complete the requirements laid out in that bill um, and not make students take additional units. That all goes through the legislative process. Um, that's, you start out with 2,500 different ideas and you get down to about 100, and then maybe, if you're lucky, 30 to 50 of those are signed. So any questions on that specifically? Um, community college operations, how the legislature impacts, how the legislature makes those decisions, and. So the, the intent language, what's the force of the intent language? What if we thumb our nose at the intent language of the legislature, what happens? There's, no, there's nothing they can do, but what has been a consequence is the chancellor, annually the, the colleges report their course offerings to the chancellor's office, and the budget committees ask for that data from the chancellor's office. So they're sitting up there at their podium making their decision, um, and while term limits has eliminated some of the institutional knowledge, uh, since that intent language was just a couple years ago, most of those members are still there. And they're looking and they're saying, hey, you didn't reduce your course offerings. We see PE growing over here. You're cutting basic skills over here. The consequence is that you'll get more strict, well, you'll get stricter language the next year that'll say, you cannot offer more than X number of units of PE. Students cannot take you know, cannot repeat a PE or a dance or a ceramics course more than twice. Um, so the intent language doesn't hold any consequence. It's more like a warning uh, to districts that, hey, we have limited resources. This is what we'd like you to prioritize. If you don't, we're going to do something worse. I think you had a question up here. It seems as if the LAO has snuck in the back door and now become sort of a policy recommending body. Um, how do you as a lobbyist respond to that? Because it, it, it often isn't to our best interest. 
Yeah, that's a good question. Traditionally, the LAO has been a fiscal um, entity. The Legislative Analyst's Office is, a, is an independent, nonpartisan. I said earlier that committees have Democratic consultants and Republican consultants, where the LAO is considered the Legislative Analyst's Office. It's nonpartisan. It looks at things um, from what's supposed to be an objective perspective and gives recommendations normally on the budget, and they've normally talked about fiscal policy. Um, and you know, just so you know, they've recommended for the last three years that the legislature increase taxes. They've said every time that the budget cannot be solved through cuts alone. Um, so what they have done, and I'll go, if you look, take a look at my earlier slide, we've seen that I said that policy has gotten injected into the budget process. And the LAO has been one of those entities that has been making recommendations on policy. And actually, it's very difficult to intervene um, when the LAO comes up with certain recommendations because the way the process is structured is in the conference committee. When we get to that process in the conference committee, in the subcommittees, we're allowed to go up and testify. When you get to the conference committee, there's no public testimony. It's essentially the LAO and the Department of Finance that are up in front of the committee, and they're the ones that answer the question. And traditionally, well, I'd say the last three years, we've had um, an LAO member who has thrown out compromises, thrown out policy proposals, kind of at the last minute, that haven't been in the best interest of, um, we, we believe, our students. Um, and, for example, doing something like performance-based funding for basic skills, where if a student doesn't complete, then the, then the college doesn't receive the funding for that student. Um, you need to intervene early. And the only way you can do that is by meeting with the members of the committee. And you kind of get a sense of which direction the LAO is going to go. Um, and what you can do is you meet with the committee chair and then the committee, the conference committee, has the individual consultants, Democratic and Republican, from their specialized committees sitting with them. So you're able to meet with them and provide counter arguments to what the LAO has recommended. And um, to be, you can also meet with the LAO and sometimes they'll t give you a heads up. Quite frankly, we met earlier this year um, with their staff and they said, um, you know, hey, we're gonna do this. And it turns out that the legislature bypassed the conference committee this year, so they didn't have an opportunity to throw this out last minute, which was good. Um, and um, so it wasn't considered. But um, yeah, the last couple years, um, the LAO has thrown out issues that really have, would hurt community colleges. And they're kind of along the same lines. They're, they're always attacking PE. They're always attacking enrichment. And, and so you can kind of anticipate the direction they're going to go. And you really have to get in early and get in often. Anyone, questions? Anyone else? Okay, well, I'm gonna kind of sh shift gears here real quick and talk briefly about redistricting, which was a recent proposition that was passed um, in 2008, Proposition 11. And this kind of gives you an idea of, of California politics. You have a major, major, major political change that's, that's being undertaken right now, and it passed by less than 1% of the vote. So it was 50.8 voting yes, 49.2 voting no. And it's, it has major political and policy Im implications on it. And it changes the way Senate and Assembly uh, districts are drawn. So the past practice was the legislature drew the districts, and obviously there's concern about that um, from some good government groups because the legislature was essentially drawing their own districts. Um, in the past, we had very, very few um, incumbents not elected. Um, and the last time we really had competitive districts was um, in the 90s, because in 1990, the legislature was controlled by Democrats, 
the governor was a Republican, and they couldn't come to an agreement. Redistricting, basically a redistricting package is like a bill. It has to pass through both, house, both houses and be signed by the governor. So it was thrown to the courts, and the courts drew the, drew the districts. In 2000, um, Democrats had the governor's seat. Democrats controlled both houses. And they essentially cut what was a bipartisan deal to protect incumbents. Um, and subsequently, during uh, the 2000s, I think there was, I think there were maybe two seats that changed parties. One was down near Baker, Bakersfield, um, went back and forth, Democrat, Republican. Um, but essentially, you've had the same parties in these same districts um, every year in and year out. The current process. So you started with 20, 60 initial applicants, the speaker and the president pro tem, who's the leader of, the speaker's the leader of the assembly, pro tem's the leader of the Senate, could throw out 24 for whatever reason. So you had 36 left and eight were randomly selected, three Democrats, three Republicans, and two nonpartisan, or I'm sorry, not nonpartisan, declined to state or other minor party. Um, and then those commissioners selected six more, two Democrats, two Republicans, to decline to state or another party. So they've held hearings throughout the state um, to try to get an idea of where political communities exist and the best way to draw these districts. They recently released their initial draft maps. Um, with these draft maps, they had to keep, you have to keep each assembly district and each Senate district relatively even in population. So once you release the draft maps, if you're gonna move one line this way to capture 1,000 more people, you have to move another line this way to capture 1,000 more people, which means you have to move this district over here, capture 1,000 people. So when they first released these maps, there was high anticipation because it gives you a general idea of where areas will be because it'll be very difficult to do a large overhaul of, of the districts. They heard comments on the maps, they're hearing it now. There have been some complaints regarding the Voter Rights Act, I'll get into that in a little bit. They'll release a second set of maps, they just announced they're gonna push that back um, in mid-July, and then they'll have their final maps August 15th. They can't take into account party affiliation, they can't take into account where incumbents live, both of which were basically the driving force of, of past map making. Um, they've kept cities rel relatively intact. Um, the previous maps, I believe it was Fresno, was actually spliced into three, and so there were three different representatives that represented Fresno. This commission has relatively kept cities relatively whole. The initial analysis says that the maps have done what they, their, their intended purpose. Um, in the assembly, Nine, there were essentially nine competitive seats. The initial analysis is that there would be 16. And this is competitive, meaning within 5% lead by Republicans or within 10% lead by Democrats because Democrats tend to cross party lines more often. The Senate competitive seats have increased from three to nine. Um, just to give you an example, this is the new, um, this would be, um, your assemblyman's new district, Mike Gatto. And essentially the way the district would be drawn is he would not be your member anymore. So Glendale's right about here. And the current um, district for Mike Gatto runs kind of here and up north, further north and comes down. Now it would come down here and grab part of East LA. Glendale would be not a part of his district. And as you can see, Glendale's actually, college is actually in a district that doesn't have an incumbent living in it. So you're kind of between where Mike Gatto might run and then Anthony Portentino is up here in this other district. Glendale would be in this district with Burbank and there's no incumbent living in there right now. Anthony Portentino has indicated he's gonna run for Congress. Um, it doesn't preclude uh, Mike Gatto from moving to run in this district. You'll see down here that you have, maybe you can see it better on the next slide, yeah. So this is Mike Gatto's district, Glendale's here. You see here, they drew a district that has Mike Davis, uh, Holly Mitchell, 
the speaker, John Perez, and Gil Cedillo all in the same district. So one of them's going to have to move. Gil Cedillo turns out. Uh, Mike Davis turns out. Holly Mitchell, uh, John Perez probably won't be the one moving, I would imagine. Um, so Holly Mitchell will have to move. But there'll be some shakeups. The pro tem, the Senate pro tem, Daryl Steinberg, was put in the same district as Lois Walk. Um, and the other interesting thing for the Senate, Senate elections are every um, four years. So you're, you run for election every two years in the assembly, but in the Senate, you run for the election every four years, and it's based on the number of your district. So even numbered districts run one year, and then two years later, all odd numbered districts run. So because of that, what you can have it, for the first year of a redistricting is you can actually have two senators living in one district and another Senate district not being represented at all. Simply because the one senator living in the district, their, their election, they're not scheduled to be reelected. The other senator is scheduled to be elected. They win re-election. So all of a sudden you have two senators representing one area, no senators representing another. So what are the issues facing the uh, redistricting commission? The first is the California Voter Rights Act. There was a letter submitted by, by um, um, those who spearheaded the Voter Rights Act that a number of districts violate the Voter Rights Act. And basically what the Voter Rights Act says is you can't disenfranchise a protected class or, or a large group of minorities, that they're entitled to um, have a representative for themselves. So if you, if you set up a district so that, for example, let's say there's a large group of, there's a large Latino community, but you set up a district so that their um, vote is so diluted that it would be impossible for them to elect a Latino representative, then that district violates the Voting Rights Act. Um, so the early analysis, they indicate that there's 14 Senate districts and 24 assembly seats that may need to be changed. Most of those are in the LA area. So there will be a shakeup in the, in the next set of maps that come out, um, particularly in this area, probably to try to conform to, to the Voter Rights Act. The stated goal as I indicated earlier, was to make co more competitive elections. Prop 11, the redistricting, along with another Proposition 14, the top two primary, which means that you don't automatically get it, a Republican and a Democrat running in the general election. But if two Democrats finish the top two in the primary, then those two are going to square off in the general election. So those two changes were meant to get more moderate members elected um, with the hope that they would also be um, less beholden to special, special interests, either on the far right or the far left. That would be labor groups on the left and um, corporate interests on the right. So will it work? As I indicated earlier, the initial assessment is that there will be more competitive districts. Um, whether that means that there'll be a, a greater moderate block is yet to be seen. There's still a large number of districts. It's hard to draw a competitive <laughs> district, for example, let's say in San Francisco. You're just not gonna get a Republican out of San Francisco. It's still gonna be a very liberal voting block. You go to Orange County, you're not gonna get, it's very unlikely that you're gonna get a competitive Democrat. It's still gonna be a very conservative Republican. Um, but there is a potential to have a, a large moderate voting bloc that could potentially swing, swing issues one way or the other. And this is my personal opinion here coming from Mark McDonald. I think there's still bigger issues that have led to California's dysfunction than district, redistricting and um, the primary election system. Number one is we have a backwards constitutional and statutory relationship. And what I mean by that is you look at the federal level, it's very, very hard to change the Constitution. It's very difficult. And the Constitution's rarely been changed. They're broad, broad, broad general ideas um, that guide specific legislation that's passed on a majority vote. 
generally speaking, at the federal level. On the other hand, in California, it's relatively easy to change the Constitution. All you need is some money and the will. So you can throw anything on the ballot. If you, if you have enough money, you can get enough signatures to get it on. And all you need is 50% plus one of the electorate to vote for it. And you've changed the Constitution. On the other hand, if you want to get taxes passed or until last year, just our annual budget, you had to get two-thirds vote out of the legislature, which is a daunting task. So for things that are supposed to last a long period of time and, and be these overarching general principles, they're relatively easy to change in California, whereas things that should change, I believe, annually and ought to change based on the generations and those in power are relatively difficult to change because you need the supermajority vote. The other issue is term limits. Um, term limits has taken away the um, uh, institutional memory of the legislature and instead of what it was intended to do was have citizen legislators that would then return to their um, homes after they'd served their time in the legislature, like Cincinnatus, um, you've gotten the exact opposite. You've gotten career politicians who are looking to their next job immediately upon entrance into the legislature. So you have the assembly where you have maybe three assembly members that would represent one Senate district. Their only goal is to get elected to that Senate district. So they're competing for the favor of the interest groups that are going to fund their election for that Senate rather than working on what's best policy. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I think term limits is a failed experiment, and there's been a couple um, efforts to at least minimize them, and I think that would probably be a good idea. Um, Uh, that's all for my presentation. Uh, if I have any questions on anything, I'd be happy to answer. I've sure. got a bigger one. Um, this is my perception. You can correct me. My perception is when Prop 13 passed and gutted a lot of the revenue base for California, that the reason we were able to recover as quickly as we were is the state turned to reserves and used that as a temporary fix. I don't see that there's ever been a long-term solution to replacing that lost revenue. And now we're in an economic downturn. It seems to be any more critical. You're talking a lot about legislative process, but what about economic base? Where's that going to change and where's it going to come from? Yeah, I, I think that the problem that we're in right now <clears throat> is a result of Prop 13. It's basically Prop 13 coming home to roost, essentially. And I alluded to it at the beginning that you have shifted the funding of not only community colleges and, and K-12 schools from locals to the state, but along with that have come, has come the regula regulatory process of it. Um, and actually the principal of our firm, McCallum Group, was the one who worked on the initial Prop 13 bailout. You're exactly right. It, it, for community colleges, there was a two-piece, one, or actually three-piece, one for local government, one for K-12, one for community colleges. Um, and he staffed the one for community colleges. But I guess to get to your question, which is where do you see the economic base coming from? Was that, where do we, where do we see the revenues coming in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think all economic reports that I've read indicate that you, ha you have a long-term systemic problem on your hands, and I don't think it's our messaging in the legislature has been the answer is community colleges. The answer is education, because to be quite frank, you have a lot of jobs in this last recession that didn't just, people just didn't get laid off. They didn't just lose their job. I mean, their job disappeared, like it's no longer there. And so you have people coming back to community colleges, coming back to get their education, to retrain, to upgrade their skills, to get back into the workforce, um, to work in new areas of the economy, the green economy. Um, you know, you still have a large service sector in California. 
Um, and, and, you know, the tragedy is that at the same time that you have this huge, huge, huge demand, you don't have the ability to fund it. And there's not a willingness um, to make the sacrifice that's needed to put the, put the resources in place so that you can provide education to, these, to the students and, and the economy of the future. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, you end up in kind of this zero-sum game at the Capitol where you're, you're basically fighting for a shrunken pie. And as community colleges, we're, we're lucky in the sense that we're part of Prop 98. I mean, look at what's happening to CSU and UC. I mean, they don't have any protection. You look at the areas you can cut in the budget, it's basically CSU, UC, some health and safety programs, um, there are federal requirements on, on a lot of health and welfare programs, and so you're really limited in where you can cut. Um, but, you know, I think it's going to be a long, gradual climb out of this. Um, I think we'll get there. I think, I think this governor was on the right path in looking at a five-year extension um, and then a long-term restructuring of um, local services and how they're provided um, but the reality is, I mean, is you're not going to get out of it with, without um, a robust educational training infrastructure within your state. I, I, we've, been going, we've been going, you know, legislator to legislator saying, you know, community colleges are the answer. Look, this is, this is tomorrow's economic base. Are, are the students that, that you're serving or the students that are here. It's interesting, too, because um, President Obama keeps saying he wants to increase the community colleges are the answer to our problems, but it doesn't come with a funding component. So um, I had a, a comment and a question. The comment was the top two primary. I think the worst thing that came out of that was third parties because we knew in the general election that there was always going to be I know they rarely get elected, but still, at least you have an option on the ballot. And now, you know, who knows what you're going to have, but you're not going to have a Green and a Peace and Freedom and all the other parties. That, um, I know there's a lawsuit, though. Right, so they could still. It right. could still change. But um, I guess my question has to do with property taxes, because I'm still a little fuzzy on exactly. I know that Prop 13 shifted everything to the state, but where exactly do the property taxes locally, how to, where are they going? And the, when property values go up again, I'm wondering if there's some hope for community yeah. colleges through that? Well, well, you're capped, right? I mean, you're, as long as you live oh, in yeah, your house, right. you can't, your, your, your valuation can't increase more than 1%. Um, you know, it can go down, of course, which has been part of the problem right. for funding of, of local entities, but um, um, there has been, there have been discussions about what's called a split roll tax, Prop 13 capped um, property tax increases on both residential and commercial property. And um, the governor mentioned it last week that, you know, he said, hey, if we don't get an agreement on revenues, then one of the things that's on the table is an initiative to go to the ballot that would reverse Prop 13 and the property tax cap for commercial property. Um, you know, obviously the um, you know chambers of commerce and and business industry don't like that, and I think in part it was a play for them because they've endorsed the governor's plan to this point, and I think it was you know. I think it's a real, I think it's a real issue that could be put out there. Generally, the electorate has supported um, Prop 13 when it comes to residential property. They haven't been so supportive when it comes to um, commercial property. But um, I think, in part, the governor said that to try to get put some pressure on the Chamber of Commerce, local chambers of commerce, to get Republicans to agree to to a tax deal. But 
on your question as to where, do the, where does the money go, what happens is you get your local property tax revenue comes to the college, and then the difference in your allocation comes from the state. So you, different colleges get different levels of state support, support depending upon how much property tax they get. In fact, I think there's three districts that are actually basic aid districts that generate enough local property tax revenue that they don't get any general fund um, base apportionment money. They're, they get their property tax revenue and they actually haven't been hurting as much because they're in the wealthier areas where property values haven't decreased as much and, and they tend to have um, more revenue than they would get if they opted into the other system. But um, one of the issues that you, that's coming up with the deferrals, we've had a lot of money deferred, which is one of the gimmicks that the legislature has used to balance the budget, which means basically we're gonna hold you to the same programmatic funding this year, but we're not gonna pay you for it till next year. Well, they can't defer local property taxes. They can only defer the state revenue, the state part of it. So districts that have lower property tax bases and are more reliant on the state general fund for revenue um, have had difficulty with much more difficulty with cash flow because a greater obviously percentage of their apportionments are being deferred. If that makes sense, did I answer your question? Are there any more questions? All right, thank you, Mark, for being here today. It was great. Um, I know we've taped it, so I'm sure it'll be on our website. And um, thanks so much for coming.